Board webinar entitled Student-Centered Learning Objectives Based Upon CFP Board Principal Topics. My name is Charles Chafin from CFP Board. Uh, presenting today will be, along with me, will be Dr. Samsbasu from California Lutheran University, Dr. Sharon Burns from Purdue University, Dr. John Grable from Kansas State, Dr. Vicki Hampton from Texas Tech, and Dr. Tom Warshower from San Diego State. Uh, one uh, uh, technology note, if you're having issues with your browser, you can hit uh, F5 if you, uh, uh, if you have Windows and Apple plus R if you have a Mac to, to reload the browser. Um, it, you know, the purpose of this project was, was to develop a resource document that outlines uh, learning objectives rel relative to the principal topics for 2012. And the idea here is that this is merely a resource to, to improve student achievement relative to that required content. And the other notion about this is this is a work in progress where we're really hoping to get uh, feedback and, and contributions from everybody that's, that's in the financial uh, planning education community. The whole idea of student-centered learning in and of itself is where the student is really active as opposed to passive. So, it, it, so it's not really teaching from the, the front of the room, but the student being engaged in, uh, and problem-solving in, in a variety of different scenarios. The teacher's role with regard to student-centered learning is more of a facilitator as opposed to standing in front of the room and, and as a lecture format only. With, we're really talking about uh, concrete benchmarks for student achievement, so based upon whatever content it is, what should the student be able to do relative to it? And then obviously we want to be able, with that, we want to be able to assess whether or not the student is able to do these things uh, through a variety of, of different means. So the question really always comes down to what is it that you want your students to, to learn or be able to do relative to a course or a unit of study or, or a body of content? Uh, so for this, for this document and for this project that, that we've merely started, this isn't a, a completed document by any stretch, the, the great opportunity with this is to, is to have a discipline-wide dialogue regarding student, student achievement relative to these topics. And, and as we said, we see this as a, as a potential resource for everyone to use in the classroom or the learning platform. And we do see this as a living document as, as, as folks continue to co contribute and offer their suggestions and feedback and, and to, try to, make this, uh, uh, to try to make this document better. There are two ways to, to contribute to this uh, project. The first way is we have a LinkedIn subgroup for registered program directors and faculty, and I've provided the link there. And you can also email uh, comments to education at cfpboard.org. Now, the, um, on the registered program webpage, there's a Word, this document is in Word form, so you can actually do track changes on that document and submit it to uh, education at cfpboard.org, and, and everyone can take a look at it. Um, for the purpose of today's presentation, on the bottom right under files, the document is actually there, so you have the opportunity to kind of uh, look through it. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Basu to we'll talk about kind of the, the methodology in developing the learning objectives with regard to uh, investment. Thanks, Charles, and uh, hello to all. And uh, it's good morning here now and wherever you are. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I want to start by reiterating what uh, Charles said just a moment earlier, that this is a resource. And uh, it has, there is nothing mandatory about it for any program. So that, I think, needs to be clarified because underlying that, there's a, there's a lot of uh, depth and wealth of thought. And so I want to just uh, spend a moment on it. It's a resource for people to use that they don't have to use. So the question is, if you used it, what would happen? So if you look back to your uh, tenure as a, as a program director, in the past, we've re never really had a way or a benchmark to measure how good our program was uh, compared to everyone else's. Are we doing the right things or not? But with this resource, uh, there comes this opportunity or this benchmark of availability where we can say that if we can get our program to be delivered at this level, then we are, we are with the group. We are doing the right things and we will grow according to the profession and so on. So it really gives us a handle on how we may evolve our programs, which we have not had before. 
And so if you want to think about that uh, from a learning objectives point of view, uh, each course or each topic or each uh, you know, item has a learning objective. And what we do, we take all these learning objectives and there are different learning objectives for different courses and we introduce those learning objectives to our students to say that during this class you're going to learn this, this stuff, all right? But if you stop for a moment, it's not just that, it's not just what you're telling students, but everything should be centered or geared around that idea that these are the learning objectives for this course. So uh, the content delivery, the exams, the assessment techniques, the post-course uh, uh, exit interviews can all now be geared to whether we did the job right or not. Did we effectively educate our students to learn what they were supposed to learn in this course? And now we have a benchmark that this is what they needed to learn. We can test that now, specifically and implicitly, and then be able to assess our own capabilities and competencies as, as to whether we did our jobs well or not. Now the, now the good side about that is that if we have done our job really well according to the learning objectives and the education is effective, in terms of our position in our schools, wherever we may be in, in different schools or departments, etc., we will have done the needful for what is required of us from our school or our institutional perspective. So I think that's what I, w I wanted to sort of stress on at the beginning, that it is a resource, but if it is viewed the right way, it's a really valuable resource. And that's why, you know, at DC I said, we really worked hard. The, uh, Charles got us to be together every week, the five or six of us, which is fairly difficult, at a certain time over, I think, eight to 12 weeks to do this. So if you look at it, look at this slide uh, and start thinking about the last topic list which had 89 topics and if you look at that topic list they had to a, a topic and then they had many many different side topics and the subtopics and we just taught around those topic lists without knowing what we you know without being specifically being told what we had to teach but now we were looking at these topics without the subtopics and asking ourselves the questions, what should a student learn from in this topic or uh, in this course where this topic is covered? So the transition issues were, were fairly severe for all of us, but in the case of investments, which I did, it, to me, of course, it seemed uh, it was especially severe because all the subtopics were gone, just the topics remained. And one of the things I had to do when I started putting down these learning objectives is to make sure that none of the content from the subtopics was thrown away. So I needed to make sure that that was kept because that body of knowledge is a requirement. And you know, I had luckily I had uh, Tom uh, Warshower on uh, on the committee who's in the same who teaches the same uh, area in the same area, and I kept referring to Tom to make sure that I was on the right track. That this is what students needed to learn and Tom and I were on the same page throughout. But, uh, Michael, if you can move forward a slide. What, what happened as we started uh, developing these uh, learning objectives, and I need to finish up, is that we found out that, you know, pl please move to the next slide. This is the old topic list, and you'll see in a moment what happened. In the new topic list, we, I put down the learning objectives, presented to the group, and said, all right, this is what I have. This keeps the context, content in, t in uh, order, but it may not necessarily be, be the topic that we are looking at. So we all got together and we started really hammering out topic by topic, 77 topics, each topic, and especially the invest one, one sometimes would take half an hour to one year, hour because there were things like commas and semicolons, the sort of the Precision of the words were very important because when you have it distributed to 340 schools, what kind of words would lead to the least errors in interpretation is an issue because then you have some kind of a standardized knowledge about the profession. So that's why we spent a lot of time trying to get the wordings to be so precise that there is minimum er area 
for misinterpretation, but then that becomes the living document because there are, uh, there are misinterpretation possibilities still, and we need your feedback. But that was the job in trying to get the learning objectives properly framed because we are sort of setting the theme for the future and a theme for raising the standards of the profession across the board for the future. And this is the first path. And I wanted to thank Charles and the CFE board for the opportunity. Thank you very much. I think I took more than my seven minutes, but I hope you don't mind too much. Thank you. Okay, I think um, the next topic has to do with um, how the uh, program configuration uh, is, can be based on, on different sorts of uh, educational programs. Um, I want the minimum is probably the six course um, to fix a six course sequence, and I I think uh, the the when you take the topic list and convert it into a six course sequence. Uh, one of the issues is what if students already know when they come into the course, and that can be quite a difficult, uh, quite a difficult issue. Um, many of the um, many of the registered uh, degree programs have six courses. Uh, several of the, uh, I'm sure, a number of the certificate programs also have six courses, and so the question is, how do you deal with what uh, students already know and what they might not? Um, so the first issue I'd like to raise is kind of what I call prerequisites, although it's a terrible name for it. It's how uh, business schools look at uh, certain of the topics. Uh, some of the topics on the, on the list are often taught as prerequisite classes and degree programs. Uh, certificate instructors in the certificate classes um, <coughs> have experience teaching in the degree programs need to be encouraged to cover those topics adequately and not assume them away. And one of the most difficult things in instruction is, of course, understanding that when, um, when you're talking with students that, um, that uh, your assumption of what they already know uh, can make or break uh, the, the transfer of knowledge. Uh, and so it's really important to, to define this properly. Um, program directors also have to be careful to uh, include um, these topics in a meaningful way in their program. Uh, two of the, uh, of the topics are, are pretty easy to accommodate um, in the fundamentals course, and that is the time value topic uh, and the business law topic, which includes uh, contracts, agency, uh, fiduciary standards, and issues like that. Those fit in the, in the, fundamental, um, in the fundamental class very well. The, um, Financial statements, however, uh, is a more difficult issue because you can teach financial statements in a fundamentals class, and in particular, you probably will teach um, the uh, you will teach the uh, personal financial planning statements uh, in um, in the fundamentals class. However, when you teach the personal financial planning statement statements. Uh, it's easy to make the false assumption that students are familiar with financial statements in general. Um, uh, you want to allow the students to understand the important relationships between the statements of financial position and cash flow statements and statements and changes in net worth. Um, and it's really difficult to do that unless you're sure to include enough background information about financial statements uh, in general. And also, you have to be sure um, to have them understand these uh, statements at, at an applications level because <clears throat> um, it is dominant that financial planners uh, uh, create financial statements for their, um, for their um, clients and, and therefore they need to know how to do that. Another prerequisite concept that can be <clears throat> easy to ignore uh, and, and write off uh, is, a, is a minor issue but actually is pretty important is the economic concepts. Uh, certainly there's, I don't think there's a financial planner today in, in the world probably that does not understand how important it is to be able to explain um, complex economic concepts to their clients 
and to explain how um, how uh, the economic environment is going to impact their clients. It's really important, therefore, that we not just trivialize uh, 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 economics uh, and um, and treat it as uh, you know simply the definition of supply and demand and and such. We need uh, and, and simple uh, issues like uh, uh, who who's in, who's responsible. Um, uh, for uh, uh, macro and who's responsible for micro decisions and things like that, it's really important to have a background in that area. Uh, statistics uh, can be built into the investments class um, because there are so many statistics applications in investments. Um, the problem with that, though, is that investments is a very uh, content-intensive uh, class. So. Uh, it's really hard to build a, a background and understanding distributions there, uh, so you need to have uh, uh, you need to have a, a way of having sufficient statistics background to really be able to understand the concepts that we need. Um, an advantage to the certificate programs is that all the classes don't have to be the same length, so it would be entirely possible in a certificate program to increase the number of contact hours or units for a credit program if you're going to try to build statistics into, um, into uh, the class and not have a separate statistics class, into the investments class. Um, Topics that uh, must, uh, you must include at least are probability and probability distributions, uh, measures of central tendency and dispersion, uh, correlation and regression, <coughs> tools like simulation modeling and sensitivity analysis. Some of these could be taught, particularly uh, Monte Carlo simulation and such, could be taught um, in the retirement class if there is one instead of, uh, instead of the investments class. Some of the new topics uh, fit well into the capstone class. The capstone class is the new uh, is the new requirement that the CM, uh, CFP board uh, put in place, and um, will be uh, the requirement uh, for applying for approval of that class is coming up uh, in the near future, uh, which means I have to get busy because I don't have mine approved yet. The um, one of the new topics that fits well into the capstone class is the client and planner attitudes, values, biases, and behavior, behavioral characteristics and the impact on financial planning. Um, one of the areas there that's particularly important is the, uh, the degree of risk aversion a client may take. This has been a continuing issue in the literature, in the Journal of Financial Planning and other sources, probably one of the most heavily published ones. Um, we need to analyze the client's degree of risk aversion, um, and we have, it has to be consistent with the client's uh, risk propensity and risk attitudes, risk capacity, risk knowledge, and, and the client's needs. Um, another issue that's important is understanding how a client's psychological profile, profile such as the Myers-Briggs assessment uh, and learning style, in value impact <coughs> uh, the format of the plan that's produced. Um, it's important to understand how a client's values, including their cultural and religious values and attitudes, uh, will affect uh, their goals uh, and uh, the planner's recommendations. Uh, it's important to describe how the behavioral uh, psychology, such as the client's comfort zone, uh, impacts the client's objectives and uh, a client's goals and understanding. It also impacts how a planner um, needs to um, educate clients uh, to, to recommendations that might be uh, outside the client's comfort zone. Uh, also under principles of communication and counseling, we have to understand the applications of counseling theory uh, to practice. We have to demonstrate how a planner can develop the uh, relationship of honesty and trust with a client. Um, to assess the components of um, communications, including linguistic signs and nonverbal communication. Uh, uh, it's very important that, um, that the 
um, that the students in these programs get sufficient experience so that they can watch, uh, watch examples of uh, poor communications and poor nonverbal communications and good communications and good nonverbal communications. Um, uh, planners need to be able to apply active listening skills when communing with a, uh, communicating with a client. Uh, it's often said that uh, of the initial interview, 80% uh, of the time ought to be spent listening, and so having good active listening skills is really very important. Um, selecting appropriate counseling and communication techniques with individual clients is also important. Uh, one of the things uh, that's important is knowing that you're um, knowing the nature of your students. Uh, the, when students are very homogenous, then making assumptions about uh, what I called prerequisites before um, is fairly easy. When students are very heterogeneous, then it's really a problem because um, <clears throat> because uh, you need to ensure that one group of students is brought up to the level maybe of the more advanced students. Uh, so where the students are more homogenous, you know uh, you can reduce the delivery of materials and maybe make room for what I call prerequisites. Where students are more basic and heterogeneous, then that may not be possible and you may in fact not be able to cover material in six courses. Where students are less homogenous, you need to prepare <coughs> learning strategies. Uh, and different techniques, so maybe they can learn uh, the students that are not familiar with some of the what I call prerequisite material may be um, <clears throat> may be covered outside of the classroom or outside of the the um, the normal uh, classroom treatment. Uh, uh, certificate program um, um, uh, uh, certificate programs are often dealing with students whose primary objective is passing the exam. I think in the classroom, in, in degree programs, that may be a little less common. But basically, um, it's not necessarily a bad thing because really an instructor ought to be able to explain why students need to know virtually everything on the list. Uh, so uh, you can actually use that in, 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 in the, uh, in the um, certificate programs is a motivation and not, not wave your hand at it and say, well, it's only required because the CFP board requires it. Remember, the CFP board built its topic list uh, on, a, on a practice uh, study and in, 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 in effort, there's nothing on the topic list that financial planners don't actually use in their practice. So if the questions come up, why do we need to know this? There should, you should be able to give that answer. So whether you're dealing with asynchronous or asynchronous or homogenous or heterogeneous students, uh, you can use the learning technologies to, to focus student attentions on the target material. Um, peer grouping is an advantage. You can use a team atmosphere when that situation exists. Um, certificate students may be more focused on their career objective and therefore more, mo mo more motivated. Thanks, so, by the way, for the opportunity to, to speak with you this morning. So now let's transition and talk a little bit about um, if you're building a program that's above the m more minimum number of courses. And this is, at least for degree programs, kind of a natural evolution that as you um, start a program, you start with a fewer number of courses, and then over time, uh, you, you find other, other things for various reasons that you want to add to the curriculum. And so the question becomes, if you do have 10 or 12 or 20 courses or whatever, uh, how, do you, how do you position the learning objectives uh, within, within the courses as you build the program? Um, do you, is the goal to have every student in the program take all of the courses? Uh, in order to be eligible to take the CFP examination, in which case you would take all these topics and spread them out across your courses? Or do you want to have those, those topics and those learning objectives more concentrated um, so that you have so-called core courses that are required uh, and, and are focusing on the, the topic list for CFP course requires? Uh, 
uh, with other courses that could be taken. The advantage of the latter, of course, is that you can build a minor um, that is a more reasonable number of courses than your major and yet have the minor eligible for CFP uh, board registration as well. So I'm using our um, undergraduate degree program here at Texas Tech kind of as an example to point out just a few ideas. Uh, first of all, as, as this program grew, um, we wanted to kind of build a culture around the program and found that if you didn't see any of the students until their junior year, it was a little hard to do that in, in the junior, senior year. And so um, here we have a one-hour course at the freshman level and then actually uh, three uh, three-hour courses at the sophomore level, uh, lower division courses, but not part of our CFP uh, certification uh, because we know the rules are those have to be taught at the junior senior level. Uh, so even though in that uh, 2315 personal financial planning for professionals, there are a number of uh, topics taught that are on the topic list, we revisit those again in a higher level course. Um, looking at the, the next slide, um, you're seeing the junior level courses and the highlighted bolded courses are the ones that are part of the CFP board um, certification documents, meaning that that's, uh, these courses that are bolded are, are covering topics that are part of the, part of the topic list. Uh, and you can see there's a fairly good number of them that are in the, in the, the junior level. The other courses that are not bolded there, uh, some of them are required courses in our degree program, some of them are electives, um, but, but they are not showing as, as covering any of the, the, the required topics. If you take taxation, for example, you see there's an accounting 3307, and that's the course that students take to cover the core topics. Uh, the PFP 3350 individual tax planning topics is a course that students are required to take, but it's it's uh, above and beyond what's what's required. And then you can look at the senior level courses um, and see that there's just a couple more courses there that are required uh, as part of the CFP board certification, uh, with the remaining courses either being electives or required as as part of the program. So. Um, so in the next slide, you see that we've actually made the choice of out of about 20 courses that the, the, the undergraduates are eligible to take, all of our uh, topic list courses and all the learning objectives um, that, that we're working with as part of this presentation are, are confined to the nine courses listed there primarily in the junior level and, and some at the senior level. Although if, you're, if your students are like ours are, if you're in a degree program, you know, the students are seniors for a long time. So, so in, in instance, the students are taking these uh, courses as juniors and seniors, even though they may be targeted one or the other. Um, one other point I want to make is that, um, going to the next slide, um, Conrad Sicatella, which many, who many of you probably know, uh, at a conference a long time ago uh, said to me, Vicki, you know, he said, uh, we teach financial planning like a dog bone, or perhaps you might call it a, a barbell model. And he pointed out that many of the things that we teach at an introductory level in some of our first courses are actually uh, revisited and taught at a higher level uh, much later in the program, usually as part of a capstone course. And so uh, this slide is just depicting that uh, what I mentioned earlier, that um, the things that uh, we, we uh, talk about with our sophomores, uh, we can actually go back and talk about it at a much higher level and, and a higher level of thinking in the capstone course and, and beyond. Um, in our program, uh, there are several of the, the core courses uh, where we only offer one course. So I think this is like a lot of programs. If you'd advance to the next slide, yeah. Uh, a, a lot of programs, we, we take those core financial planning courses and we, we teach, um, you know, one course. And uh, as I think Tom pointed out, all courses don't have to be the same length. Uh, and, and we've struggled and changed several times in the, in the past 10 years, but 
uh, we've kind of finally figured out that we think anyway that the insurance planning and risk management um, probably needs to be a four-hour course um, where others um, we can maybe cover in three. So we have several of the courses that at least in the registration are, are only one course. And then in the next slide you see that we also have some where we've, we've thought that uh, two courses were needed. So in the investment planning area, we've divided the topics uh, across two courses. So the students are getting a total of six hours with those two courses. One's a fairly fundamental basic investing kind of course and the other's more of a uh, an asset management type of portfolio construction course as it relates to individual portfolios. Um, and then the other area is in the inter interpersonal communication skills. Uh, this is a really important area that um, in, in dealing with practitioners over and over again, they say that this is just critical to their practices and to the, to the students that they're hiring. Um, out, out of programs. So we have two interpersonal communication skills courses. Uh, one is a Southmore level course and not part of the re uh, required, well, it's part of our, our, our required curriculum, but not, not registered, and then one at a, a Southmore area, or at a junior area. Uh, and finally, um, the last thing is professional conduct and, and fiduciary responsibility. Uh, and this is something that we believe anyway should be taught across the curriculum, uh, which segues very nicely to um, um, our, our next speaker. Uh, Sharon's going to be talking about teaching across the curriculum. Hello. Um, this is Sharon Burns. And um, one of the issues that comes up is teaching a concept that might be taught, number one, in multiple courses, or number two, um, and there are a lot of those, by the way, um, and we have examples of those. Uh, some courses are taught external to our departments. Uh, for example, at Purdue, we have an estate planning course and the tax course that are taught in Ag Econ, and the investments course they could get it in our department, which we prefer, and some of the students, because they're short on time because of changing their degree objective, take a course over in the business school. So there's some issues about um, about ta uh, taking these classes, or about how we organize the curriculum and how we get other um, faculty members on board with, uh, with teaching what we need to have taught when we have maybe no authority or no power. There's also a case or a, a potential situation where the program director is not the department chair, so the department chair has to understand the importance of being a registered program and um, the need for meeting or teaching enough of the learning objectives that a student can pass the exam. I mean, that's one of the things they want. We certainly want to teach more than that, but that would be a minimum. So the first, I tried to divide it into steps, is that we need to communicate the learning objectives. So we would ask that all of us take these learning objectives and, <coughs> excuse me, um, forward them to our colleagues, even those who might be teaching some of our courses in other departments or some of our required courses in other departments. Uh, it might also be helpful to have a meeting at some point with all of the faculty who teach any of the courses. Uh, core courses so that uh, everybody's kind of on the same stage. And then uh, offering a common language to minimize confusion is really important. Um, and this is, for example, in my one example is cost basis. Um, in um, obviously in retirement planning, we don't necessarily, we kind of talk about the basis in retirement plans, but we also talk about contributions. We talk about distributions and um, so there's a language that needs to be taught so that students get it, if they get language in their tax class, they see that same language and those same, um, the same semantics later on as well. So there's a lot of different components to uh, teaching a core concept across the curriculum. So cost basis, for example, will be seen in tax, obviously, um, mainly with respect to capital gains in a Schedule D situation or a small business sale. 
it sh it'll be taught in investments, again, kind of going to that same place. In risk and insurance, it's, a, it's kind of a totally different concept. It's uh, premiums paid or contributions in, um, net cost, if it, it kind of subtracts out the dividends that have been re, um, uh, given back out. So there's a lot of uh, different language where it's really still kind of a cost basis concept, that anything above that re has a gain of some sort that's taxable. Uh, again, with retirement planning, we talk about cons, uh, contributions uh, and some of those. Um, so that that this becomes a real issue in this in these programs, I guess, is, is to teach a concept across uh, different classes in the curriculum. Um, here, I gave a list of, of an example of topics. Um, and so, uh, that might occur in, a, in the five or six different courses, and then some of the items that go across concepts. So, for example, in estate planning, we're going to see charitable contributions, current gifts, and deductibility of deferred gifts. Um, you might also, in charitable contributions, those might come up in retirement planning with this, the tax deductibility of IRA um, uh, donations, because for a couple years that was allowed. Um, you'll see that in cash flow management too if you're looking especially at the like retirement plans or the late life um, planning of cash flow across the years. With housing, of course, you get the tax deductibility of interest and property taxes, um, but you'll talk about those in tax and in housing. So this just gives you an idea of how we, we, ended up, we end up crossing a curriculum. And I would um, maybe think about using the learning objectives and going through, and if you don't have anything to do with your time right now, now that you're several weeks into the semester, um, maybe making a master chart of these uh, concepts and the six or eight courses that you have and where all those concepts hit so that you can make sure that there's a common nomenclature going across um, and that you communicate with those faculty members. Okay, what's taught in the basic tax class? And then, um, you, you know, then where does, it, where does it hit again? One example I had is um, I was doing teaching the retirement planning class, and I mentioned that um, a corporate plan, a qualified plan, would probably need it, uh, to have its investment policy statement as well, not just individuals. And I saw some blank looks on my students' faces. And so I think some of them had taken investments one, during one semester, and they didn't quite get the investment policy statement um, hit that the other ones got when they took it from a different instructor. So again, um, a, a master chart for your program might be useful as well. Buttons here. <clears throat> so the deductions, again, um, you, if we talk about the concepts, not just the topics, but the concepts in terms of a tax concept, we have deductions, credits, compliance, and basis. And under compliance, you're going to hit the title of compliance in tax, in state planning and retirement planning. And that's just from a tax standpoint. You're also going to hit um, compliance in your capstone course probably and maybe um, in your investments course. Or if the students, like in our program, they take a sales and negotiation course. So um, the, we talk a lot about compliance in those courses as well. Uh, if you talk about tax credits, you're going to see them in education planning and retirement planning with the savings credit. Uh, investments, you probably would see, or credits, you would probably see the uh, foreign tax credit maybe with some investments, especially with mutual funds that are international. So again, we can group these items by concept or we can group it by topic, like housing risk, um, or housing risk and insurance investments, et cetera. So the main things are to try and, and get a coordinated effort of all your faculty members uh, where are they getting these concepts? Where are they getting these topics? And are we all teaching the same, uh, teaching to build as well, and teaching with the same nomenclature and the, and the same semantics, and teaching toward the same goal of them um, meeting the learning objectives that uh, will prepare them well for the CFP exam as well as for being a practitioner. That's all I have for today. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you, Sharon. We're gonna we're gonna take a, a, just a couple of minutes while folks uh, type in their questions, and then we'll uh, we'll uh, have some dialogue and, and answer your questions. So just a, just a couple of minutes.
Okay, we're going to uh, get into some of the questions. If you, you still have time to write in a question, it's there on the, the top right. Um, I'm going to read this uh, question for the panel, and if you want to, to jump in on this. Uh, active learning takes time both in and out of class. How do you balance engaging students uh, in doing aspects of financial planning while still covering the topics that need to be uh, needs to be covered in class. So finding that balance between, uh, I think, w what the person's asking between the, the whole idea of theoretical knowledge and then application. How do you how do you find a balance with that in your classroom? Anyone want to want to take a shot at that? Well, this is Sharon, and and as a result of. Um, actually doing this learning objectives project with you, uh, Charles, um, I revamped my retirement planning class to 15% um, basic knowledge and comparison and types of things like that, mainly by requiring them to read ahead and having a quiz that they take prior to talk, starting on the topic. So they should know, for example, that the maximum a person can put in their IRA is $5,000, $6,000 if they're over the age of 50 prior to ever starting so that I don't have to repeat very basic items. Um, so that's one way I do it. And then the second thing, uh, the second thing I do is uh, talk about theory about 20, 25% of the time and then the rest on application. That's just in, a, in an advanced course that's uh, focused on one topic, not any kind of survey course or a course taking a lot of topics. That's what I would, that's how I do mine. This is Vicki. Um, uh, kind of similarly, uh, although I haven't employed the quiz, uh, just greater reinforcement that, that the student is responsible for the basic information um, and that if they have questions about the basic information, it is their responsibility to bring those questions. But the class time then is spent primarily on applications and, and cases and opportunities for them to, to work through things, applying uh, applying and, and um, evaluating and, and trying to move it to a little bit higher level. I think it partly depends on the number, on the particular class. Uh, some classes, as I mentioned, the investments class is so content heavy, content rich, um, that um, that it, it and it's sufficiently complicated content that you can't simply um, can't simply let the students uh, rely on their reading and and I think that's why even though my presentation had to do with the six course area <laughs> why I think sometimes you just need to have uh, additional uh, time in order to uh, to reach high, the higher cognitive levels and, and use more active learning techniques because um, because uh, the content is so heavy and and complex. Other times, uh, in others of our courses, uh, we can um, ask students to come to class pretty much uh, prepared with, uh, with at least the first two cognitive levels and the lower cognitive levels and 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 push, um, uh, uh, spend most of the class time um, on, um, um, on the higher cognitive levels and also make assignments, particularly group assignments, where people can, can work that way. Uh, the, the next question has to do with uh, assessment. Uh, and ask what types of grading rubrics do you use, and do you use similar rubrics uh, ac across courses? I, I could, uh, I, I'll just uh, address that uh, one point in this question. In terms of grading rubrics, I think when you put your syllab syllabus together and you have your course objectives and learning outcomes, because you can see the syllabus is very key to learning objectives. And it all falls from that. So when you have the course objectives and learning outcomes, you're going to specify the learning objectives for the course. Then you, when you look at your assessment section, whether you have you know, quizzes or midterms or finals, actually it really helps to key in, in your syllabus, 
how much of the learning objectives for this class will they see in the test, 60%, 70%. So if you look at our syllabi, and this is very consistent with our regional accreditors too, we put, we'll put down how much of the learning objectives will be tested and how much of the grades will reflect those learning objectives so that if you have a pre-assessment and post-assessment, that will allow you to see if your education is effective or not. So what I would say in terms of grading rubrics is make sure you make it explicit in your syllabus up front that these are the topics, these are the objectives, at least 70%, 60 80 whatever you feel, down to the topics. This is how much of your, of your grades are covered in, from the topics in these, uh, in these questions. These are the topic areas. This is how much the grade covers. And when you do that, you are covered as part of the syllabus being the contract with your students because you have made it explicit. But the flip side is when you use that, the institutionally, you can show the institution that you are very consistent with the educational effectiveness and learning objectives and outcomes, which is pretty much what your dean or your supervisor wants to be looking at. So it's, it really can help you be in a win-win situation but that's what I would say. Put down the learning objectives for each course in the syllabus. And for after the assessments, put down a section. And I'm, I'm happy to share with you guys because we have syllabi like that. We actually make explicit that these learning objectives, so much of the grades in the assessment section are keyed into those objectives. And that really helps with both students and the institution. Thank you. And in addition to that, if you know, if you're thinking about grading rubrics for specific projects, um, I find that we are not really probably consistent from course to course. Now, in terms of syllabi, yes, we are consistent in, in what's a good syllabus and what's required. But in terms of if it's the capstone class and so it's the comprehensive case study or if it happens to be in my fundamentals class where it's more of an education planning project, an education funding project, or whatever. You know, each faculty um, develops their own rubric in terms of you know, how, what is expected of the student and, and how many points they're going to get for various things. But uh, the grading rubrics, I find, are um, invaluable just in terms of being consistent and you know, thinking through what you want, giving your, your students guidance in terms of what you're expecting from them. Um, it's amazing how astute the students are if you tell them this is how they're going to be evaluated, that they will do their best to, to for the most part, to, to meet that standard. Um, and I find them very useful. You know, and I, I would add to that too. You know, in a lot of cases, sometimes there'll be some really great objectives or, or benchmarks set in a in a syllabus, and then there's no instrument to really find out whether or not the student has met those achievement objectives. And um, and a lot of times, going a step further with that is that rubric, you know, really is an opportunity to evaluate not only the student achievement, obviously, but what you see is most important. And and I think Vicky just alluded to that fact that. Student, get, student getting that rubric the first day of class, it really shows the student what you think is really, really important, and they, and they can focus their efforts on that as well. So it's a, the rubric is a, is a great instrument to make sure that the benchmarks are being met, but it's also a bit of a, a you know, talking about the comprehensive plan, as Vicki alluded to, it's a bit of a philosophy statement, because how you weight that is really indicative of how much time maybe you're spending on that in, in the course, which is based upon what you think is, uh, is most important. Uh, this is Sharon. I think the rubrics are also really helpful to uh, adjunct faculty members and others who are not full-time instructors or professors uh, to give them some to help them with some guidance if they need it. Uh, obviously, how you communicate this to them is really important. But um, but it does help them as well if they set up a rubric that can then then be built on later. And the uh, last question here is, uh, in contributing to this project, how much has it affected your own, uh, your own teaching in the, the classroom? 
What a great question. Yeah. I'll say hugely for me. Uh, <laughs> in, fact, in fact, I'd say the, the impact was so big that it's going to take probably somewhere between a semester and a year before we um, before we fully um, execute all the changes that I would like to make um, due to my better understanding of, of what we're trying to do. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, uh, that that wasn't just due to the effort, the team effort we had in putting together the learning objectives, but also for people that observe it uh, and, and want to use it, uh, that they'll be able to understand um, uh, the, all the different ways that it could could affect their curriculum. Uh, this is Sharon. I totally revamped the retirement planning class in terms of not the topics that are discussed, but how they're t how they're taught. Uh, kind of going with that ratio I gave you earlier, and um, the grading rubrics or the grading evaluation or assessment evaluations. One other thing I'd like to comment on, sorry to pop in again. One other thing was um, that I think uh, from what, what little changes we've made in, uh, already in uh, two of our classes, the students really seem to like it a lot better because with, a higher, with the emphasis on the higher cognitive levels, they, um, they can see, they can see the importance of the information much more readily uh, than they could uh, when you're teaching primarily, which what we were doing is teaching primarily at at the lower cognitive levels. I, I think the students like it like the changes very much. I agree. Uh, this is Vicki. I just finished up our section on financial statements and analysis, and um, you know I I went from you know, this is an asset, this is a liability, da 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 da, to, to going almost directly into, um, you know, why, why we develop these statements and what the goal is and, and letting them work with statements and, and do some evaluation and analysis and whatever. And they just were, were much more in, in, engaged, a lot, a lot more engaged. And I'm sure well, I'm not sure yet because the exam's tomorrow, but uh, I, have, I have a feeling that they probably have gotten to a lot higher level um, this way than, than by, by me doing so much lecturing. I'm going to, uh, uh, one more question, and that is basically asking here, how do you, how do you know what, which objectives to use, which outcomes to use with regard to each topic. So, so basically, when do you decide on using a, a, a knowledge indicator like identify, or when should you go ahead and use one like, uh, like apply or construct, one of the higher level ones? How do you know which ones to use in a, in a given class on a given topic? It's a good question. It's a hard question. Um, hmm. Could you repeat that again one more time, please? Basically, they're asking, when do you know, when do you, and looking, if you have a list, many of these have a list of topics, like, or a list of uh, outcomes, like four or five per topic. And the ones at the top are saying identify and whatnot, and some at the bottom say construct or apply. When, which ones should you use and, and when? How do, you, how do you make that decision on which ones to use in a given class? Oh, okay. uh, partly, I guess you'd have to say that it, it's a, it's partly a result of the of the of the uh, topic itself. Um, what I mean by that it's it's hard hard for me to give an example from the current topic list, but I'll give an example from well I, I I'll give an example from the current one, not the new topic list, and that is um, there was mention of a uh, arbitrage pricing on the topic list previously, at least on the. Um, detailed topic list. Um, I didn't expect our students to, to be able to apl even apply, let alone evaluate, uh, anything to do with APT. I expected them barely to know what APT was. Uh, so, you know, so I felt that that was a topic I would teach at the lowest cognitive level. Uh, other topics like the um, uh, econ topics, 
um, I think uh, I think uh, needs we need we really need students to be able to apply current economic and expected economic conditions to implement it in the financial plan. So I think I think it it um, it partly depends on your assessment of how financial planners actually use each topic. There's also another thing, and actually this is. If, uh, if you were at DC, uh, we talked about it because there's a separate section to the learning objectives, and that's the Bloom's taxonomy. And we had a separate presentation on that, and, and this is something we talked about. If you look at the Bloom's taxonomy presentations for each topic list, the six of us or five of us had, did a Bloom's taxonomy for each topic, or at one topic each. And if you look at that, that's what sort of specifies this classification of words and the verbiage that I talked about earlier, the precision. If you see things like identify and discuss at the top, they are at the lower level of blooms. So that they could be material that you introduce in the beginning of the course or beginning of a section of a, of a topic or a content area. And then as you, as you look down the learning objective, you'll see the words changing and essentially, if you look at, uh, closely at the words, they're changing to show you that as you go through the class, those simple items, contents that you use as foundation and building block, you start getting more complex in your buildings and your approach. And then by the time you've got to the fourth or fifth learning objective and the words, you will see that you're teaching at a very high level. So those words encompass the whole sort of spectrum between uh, introducing a topic at a very elementary level, getting the foundation and building block, and down to the last objectives or the wordings, which says now you're into complex thing. You're going to communicate. You're going to counsel. You've got to know how to do all that. And that starts from the first. So when you look at those topics, you've got to do all of them, but there's an order in Bloom's taxonomy where you build from a lower level to the higher levels of thought so that by the time you come to the sixth level of Bloom's taxonomy, if all of us operated at that level, this profession would be at its, at its highest or close to its highest level. And that's, that's pretty much for you to decide at what level you want to teach, but you do want to teach all and the six levels of Bloom's taxonomy. How deep you want to go to it is up to you because again, it's a resource, but it just keeps you very well protected. You're doing the right thing. And that's what these are about. And, and one other note about that, which I, many of the speakers alluded to today, and, and that is knowing your students. You know, if your students are coming in and, and they're, you know, mid-career professionals, you, you may be able to get a little bit further in that in that process of, of we say, covering the topics, which really is kind of teacher-centered, but really focusing on those topics at a much higher level than someone that's coming in maybe as a blank slate that could be a career changer, for example, or, or an undergraduate. So uh, I, it kind of goes back to that point, too, of, of knowing that the achievement level of your students coming in, whether that's through knowing their, their experience in education or even some sort of uh, uh, examination to entrance examination to find out where they are, that makes a big difference, too, in, in their level. Well, uh, thank you for attending today. We really do hope that you will contribute to this project. This is not a, a completed document by any stretch, and I think that uh, if you share this with your colleagues and, and get their input, we, we really want to see dissent here, and, and we want to see folks that, that, that contribute and offer their suggestions so that we can make it as a, a powerful resource as possible. Um, and the uh, earlier slide talks about the, the LinkedIn group as well as education at cfpboard.org. CFP.net slash registered programs has a copy of this document in Word form to use track changes, and, and we hope you'll uh, uh, contribute. Uh, thank you very much to the, to the panel, and, and thank you, everyone, for, for participating. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you very Bye -bye. much, Charles, and the CFP board. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.